we go into the wild blue yonder, climbing high into the sun. Here they come, zooming to me, tower thunder. At the boy, give us a gun, give us a gun. Now down we die, stopping our plane from under. Off with one terrible roar. We live in fame for renown. Hello, fellas. I understand you're ready to be checked out on the P-39. I see you've been reading over your pre-flight dope. That's the right idea. It's very important to have the technical orders covering the operation and first echelon maintenance well in mind before you take the plane off the ground for the first time. It should be thoroughly covered. Then, too, you should spend enough time in the cockpit to be certain you fully understand the instructions in the TO manual. In reading this material, you've probably learned a lot about the P-39. As you can see, it's a low-wing monoplane of the Interceptor Pursuit class, and it's designed to pack quite a wallop. It's equipped with a tricycle landing gear, which is retractable, but just forget that there are three wheels instead of two. It handles much like any other plane. The Allison liquid-cooled engine is behind the pilot, and a drive shaft runs forward to a reduction gearbox, which drives the constant speed propeller. This arrangement makes possible the installation of a high-caliber automatic cannon along the thrust line. Some models have a 20-millimeter cannon, and others a 37-millimeter. In addition, there are two synchronized 50 caliber guns in the nose and two 30 caliber guns in each wing panel. You have enough armament here to take care of yourself and make it uncomfortable for the enemy as well. The guns are charged from the cabin and are fired electrically. There is a gun selection panel in the cockpit where you can switch on any or all of the guns. On the stick, there's a trigger for the 30s and 50s, and a separate button for the cannon.
Considering the firepower the P-39 carries, the rate of climb is exceptional. Its critical altitude varies in the different models between 13,000 and about 17,500 feet. Absolute ceiling is from 32 to about 35,000 feet. The engine in the different models varies from 1,150 horsepower at sea level upward according to the rating of the particular engine. Cruising at 2,300 RPM and 30 inches of manifold pressure at an altitude of 5,000 feet gives approximately 250 miles per hour indicated airspeed. Stalling speed is about 95 miles an hour indicated, fully loaded and with the flaps down. She handles very well and responds nicely to the control. The more detailed information you have from your reading and the thorough check of the cockpit, then you'll be ready to check out. Have any of you finished yet? Yes, sir. All right, Lieutenant, let's get started. Setting up on the wing, here's your hand grip. And be sure you don't step on the wing, Philip. I see you know your parachutes, Lieutenant. Buckles properly attached and the straps fit well. I guess you know that it pays to have your parachute right. Okay, climb in. Compact little office, isn't it? You'll find everything you need here, and all conveniently located. First, have a look at the rudder pedals to see if they're properly adjusted for you. Down on the side of the pedal, there's an adjustment with five positions. Press the lever with your toe and set the pedal to the length that's comfortable for you. And do the same on the other side, but be sure both pedals are set to the same position. You might look back at the rudder as a further check on this. And at the same time, try your controls to be sure of their operating sense. Check the rudder, the elevators, and your ailerons, too. Now, set your brake. First, hold out the brake handle. There about the radio panel. Then press in on your brake pedal. Then release the handle. Now let's fasten your shoulder straps. This harness is for your safety and it should be worn at all times. In the event of an emergency landing, it will prevent you from being thrown forward. The adjustable straps fasten to the seat belt buckle. Slide them on the catch and the seat belt hook will hold them in place. The release fastens securely and it can be opened in a jiffy, releasing both the shoulder straps and the seat belt. Down on your left is a knob which controls the shoulder harness lock. Pull it up and it releases the harness so that you can reach forward. Reset it and it locks the harness again. There's a top latch up here on each door. Keep it from being sucked outward at high speed. Be sure they're both fastened securely before you take off. And be sure the door handle is in the closed position, that is, horizontal. And down here on either side, there's an emergency release for the doors. If you ever have to, pull that out, and the entire door will fall away. Let's give it a try. You don't have to undo the top latch to release the door, but you may have to nudge it with your elbow to jar it loose at low speeds. Both doors work in the same way. Here, let's plug in your radio connections. Just behind your right shoulder are the jacks for your throat mic and headset. Be sure they're securely fastened.
Then over here on your right is the transmitter. You can send either CW or voice, and there's a selection switch for the four bands. When you want to transmit, press the button on the throttle. Down in front of you are the receiver controls. There are three of them for ground, interplane, or beam reception. On your right is a hand crank for manual operation of the landing gear should the electric drive fail. To use it, first turn the clutch selector rod to the manual position, that is, pointing aft. There's a ratchet fall on the crank for up and down operation. Normally, however, the gear is operated by means of the electric motor drive and the clutch handle should be in this position. The switches for all electrical equipment are on the left side of the instrument panel. Be sure the landing gear switch is not in the up position. Check the gun switches to be sure they're all off before turning on the main battery switch. It's on the right side of the switch panel and the generator switch is just below it. You might try your flaps to be sure they're working properly. The first of the three travel indicators is for your flaps. The other two are landing gear. Aside from being used in landing, the flaps can also be used to shorten your takeoff run on a small field. For this, one quarter flap should be used. However, I don't recommend that you use flaps for takeoff until you're more familiar with the plane. The propeller on this plane is an aero products propeller which operates automatically. It changes pitch hydraulically by means of a cylinder in the propeller hub and the only control is on the throttle quadrant. Some P-39s are equipped with Curtis electric propellers. For these there is a governor control on the throttle quadrant similar to the other. In addition there's a safety switch and a switch for automatic control. If automatic operation fails, there are manual increase and decrease positions on this switch. When you turned on the battery, it energized the fuel transmitter. Remember always to check the fuel in your tanks. Down on your left is a fuel selector valve, which makes it possible to draw fuel from four lines, three actual tanks. For takeoff and landing, always use the reserve tank, which is part of the left wing tank. In actual operation, the fuel is pumped from the tank to the selector valve through which the fuel lines from all tanks pass. From the selector valve, the fuel flows to the strainer where all foreign matter is filtered out. Then to the electrically driven booster pump, which replaces the old type wobble pump. It is used to pump fuel to the carburetor for starting the engine at high altitudes to prevent vapor lock in event that proper fuel pressure cannot be maintained, or it can be used in case the engine-driven fuel pump fails. The fuel then goes to the engine-driven pump, which normally supplies sufficient pressure when the engine is in operation. From the fuel pump, the fuel continues on into the carburetor. In some models, there is a vapor eliminator system included here, and it is designed to overcome vapor lock. A red warning light on the instrument panel lights up when there is a drop in the fuel pressure, such as is caused when a tank empties. There is a small tank unit in the system which can supply enough fuel to keep the engine going for 90 seconds until you have had time enough to change to another tank. There is also a vapor return line through which vapor and excess raw gas from the carburetor flow back to the left tank at an appreciable rate. The reserve tank is really part of the left wing tank. Here there are two finger screens at the head of the two fuel lines which flow from the tank. The tall finger screen is for the left wing tank, and through this line you can draw the 40 gallons which are above the standpipe. Below this, the remaining 20 gallons or a full tank of 60 gallons can be drawn through the lower finger screen, which is the reserve tank. For long distance flying, these planes can be equipped with a belly tank varying in the fuel capacity from 75 gallons upward. 
The tank is attached to the underside of the fuselage by means of sway braces, and it can be released during flight by pulling out on the bomb release handle in the cabin. With the fuel selector valve in the auxiliary tank position, fuel from this tank is drawn up into the selector valve and then through the same system that the fuel from the other tanks follow to the carburetor. When you change your selector valve to the right wing tank, you can draw 60 gallons. Just as in the other tanks, the fuel from here goes first through the selector valve and then through the rest of the system in the same way as did the others. Back of the trim tab controls is a carburetor heat control, which you'll seldom have need for. Under extreme icing conditions, press the button to pull it out and it will bring warm air from the engine compartment to the carburetor. Well, now you've read all your pre-flight material and you've spent enough time in the cockpit to thoroughly familiarize yourself with all the controls and adjustments. Let's assume that you're taking her up for the first time. First, you'd set your fuel selector valve to the reserve tank where with full tank you have 60 gallons. Then on the throttle quadrant, be sure the mixture control is an idle cutoff. The prop governor is placed full forward to low pitch or high RPM, and the throttle is cracked open about three quarters of an inch. On the side of the quadrant is a tension adjustment. Be sure you have a firm feel to all three of your controls to prevent them from creeping. Turn on the battery and generator. Then to prime the engine, first crack the primer. Turn on the booster pump. Then pull out the primer so that it fills. Turn off the pump and then push the primer in, locking it. In colder weather, you may have to do this two or three times. Then turn the ignition to both on. The inertia starter pedal is down on the right side. Press it back to energize. During the energizing operation, turn on the booster pump, which will bring your fuel pressure to about 13 and a half pounds. When sufficiently energized, check to see that your prop is clear before pressing forward to engage. As soon as it coughs and catches, move the mixture control to automatic rich. Then turn off the booster pump long enough to be sure the engine-driven pump is operating. Oil pressure should be above 50 pounds and the oil temperature around 30 degrees before takeoff. During warm-up, the coolant temperature will rise more rapidly than the oil. On your right side are the controls for the coolant and oil shutters. Be sure they're open sufficiently. In warm weather like this, the coolant shutter should be opened all the way, while to keep the oil temperature even with the press stone, it need be opened only to the flush position. In colder weather, it would be almost fully closed. If everything is in good order and she's idling all right, you're about ready to taxi out to the runway. After calling the tower, be sure your doors are shut and latched. You'll be more comfortable with the windows fully closed. In this type cockpit, it isn't necessary to wear goggles. Then set your trim tabs. The recommended setting for the elevator is three or four graduations nose up, the rudder four graduations right rudder, and the aileron trim tabs zero setting. Then release your brakes by depressing both brake pedals. For taxiing, you'll find that the P-39 requires only a small amount of throttle, between 1,000 and 1,200 RPM. To turn in close quarters or at slow speeds, you can get full swivel action in the nose wheel by the use of the main wheel brakes, and you'll be able to turn almost in your own span. To prevent overheating, don't delay in getting out to takeoff position for a final engine check. You'll find that the plane has very good taxiing characteristics and that the brakes are very effective. You can taxi downwind, crosswind, or in any direction very easily.
it is unnecessary to ride the brakes. At the end of the runway, call the tower and advise them that you're about to complete your final warm-up and check-off before flight. Set your brakes for the rev-up, then advance the throttle. Be sure the various pressures are okay and your temperature is low enough. Be very careful not to overheat. Check the magnetos at 2300 RPM. First, switch to right magneto, and the drop-off here should be maximum 100 RPM. Then switch to left, and the drop-off should be maximum 60 RPM. Then back to both, and the tack should climb back to 2300. To be sure the prop governor is functioning properly, pull it back. There should be a drop in RPM. Then push it forward to full low pitch for takeoff. Check the ammeter to see that the generator is working. It cuts in between 1300 and 1400 RPM. Finally, to be sure that everything is in good order, there's a checklist provided on the instrument panel. Refer to it and go over everything once more. Are your fuel tanks full? Is the selector valve on reserve? Prop governor, full forward and automatic rich on mixture. Fuel pressure up to 14 to 15 and a half pounds. Oil pressure up. Oil temperature okay. Coolant temperature okay. Suction up. And is your gearbox oil pressure okay? Now you're all set. Look around to be sure you're in the clear and then open your throttle smoothly. Remember that you have a lot of power pulling this plane and there'll be a lot of torque, so use full right rudder. You should have 3,000 RPM and 45 and a half inches of manifold pressure. As you gather speed, it will feel like any conventional plane. However, avoid a long run. When you have sufficient speed, 100 miles per hour, pull back gently, and you'll lift off the ground quite suddenly. When you're safely off the ground, retract the landing gear. Keep an eye on the indicators to be sure they're coming up all right. When the wheels are fully retracted, the limit switches cut off the motor, the ammeter should drop back to normal. The landing gear indicators will be fully up and you can turn the switch to neutral. When you're clear of all obstacles bordering the field and she feels all right, throttle back to normal climbing power, 37 and a half inches of manifold pressure with the prop governor at 2600 RPM. Your airspeed indicator should show about 160 miles per hour. No turns should be attempted at less than 150 miles per hour. As you change RPM and power and as your speed increases, you'll want to adjust your trim tab. During the climb, watch your operating temperatures. At 160 miles per hour, your best climbing speed, cooling is the most critical. Be sure your coolant shutter is open sufficiently to keep the engine temperature down. When you reach a safe altitude, level off. Throttle back to 30 inches of manifold pressure and pull the prop governor back to 2280 RPM. Depending on the temperature of the air, the coolant shutter should be adjusted for proper cooling of the engine. In extremely hot weather or in tropical climates, they should be kept pretty well open, somewhere between flush and full open. You'll find that the P-39 has excellent visibility in all directions, forward, rearward, above, and on either side. Referring to the checklist once more, be sure that everything is functioning properly, that the fuel and oil pressures are up, and that the temperatures are up. Then, with everything operating smoothly, give some attention to the characteristics of your controls. You'll find that they are sensitive and respond nicely. Then try a few turns to see how she handles.
with the landing gear and flaps retracted, try a stall. Ease back gently on the sticks, keeping the nose slightly above the horizon. You'll find that in this condition, the stalling speed is about 105 miles per hour. Ease the stick forward, and be sure you build your airspeed up sufficiently to completely unstall your wing, at least 140 miles per hour before leveling off. Then take it back up to a safe altitude again and try another stall. Only this time have the landing gear and flaps extended. It'll give you a good chance to study the plane's stalling characteristics and the landing condition before you bring her in for the first time. Since you're going to extend your landing gear, you might try the manual operation. Be sure the landing gear electrical switch is in the neutral position, and then change the clutch handle to the manual position. To firmly engage it, switch the ratchet ball to up and crank to retract the gear. This will bring the clutch handle fully to the manual position. Then change the ball to down and start cranking. Because you'll be pulling against the pressure of the slipstream, keep your airspeed below 140 miles per hour so you won't have to put so much weight behind it. With your landing gear extended, lower your flaps and then try another stall. In this condition, you'll find that your stalling speed will be about 95 miles per hour. To retract the landing gear, change the clutch back to the electric position and retract the gear with the electric motor drive. Retract the flaps as well, but be sure you put the landing gear and the flap switches back to the neutral position when they're fully retracted. that in either condition the stall is gentle and there is no pronounced tendency for the plane to fall off on either wing. And now you should be pretty well acquainted with the basic handling qualities and general flight characteristics. Before shooting your first landing, you might give her the gun and see how she works. Now well, you've had a good workout and have gotten the feel of her pretty well. Let's bring her in for a landing. might refer to your checklist again. You'll find it helpful. Switch the fuel selector valve to the reserve or right tank, depending upon which one has the most fuel, and throttle back to about 15 inches of manifold pressure. Push the prop governor up to about 2,600 RPM. When your airspeed has dropped to less than 200 miles per hour, the landing gear can be extended. Keep an eye on the indicators. When the wheels are fully extended, the pop-up indicator on the nose cowling and one in each wing panel will be visible. The travel indicator will be down and the ammeter should read normal. In making your approach, you'll find that with the P-39's excellent visibility in all directions, you will not have to make a close turn to keep track of other traffic in the air. You can come straight in if you want to. Keep your speed up sufficiently until you're beyond all obstacles bordering the airport. When your speed is about 140 miles per hour, lower the flaps.
Glance at the indicator to be sure the flaps are full down. Use your elevator trim tab to lighten the stick forces due to the change in trim with the gear and flaps extended. Now remember, you'll be bringing this plane in for the first time. It's only natural that you won't be fully accustomed to it and perhaps a little uncertain. But don't forget your traffic regulations. Don't make a right turn instead of a left into the airport. Just take it easy and establish a steady glide. Be careful not to come in too fast. If you're not quite straight with the runway and you find that you're not going to be able to set her down on the first third of the runway, don't be afraid to take her around again. It's much better and safer to make a good landing on the second or even the third try than to bring her in for a bad landing the first time. In going around again, don't forget your flat. On your next try, be careful to make a wide enough turn coming in so as not to crowd yourself. Get lined up with the runway early. Then you can concentrate on maintaining a proper approaching airspeed. Now your approach is steady and you're lined up with the runway, but you're still coming in a little too fast. You haven't broken your speed sufficiently to make a tail low landing on the first third of the runway. You will land on three wheels, fast and a little rough. There's no great hazard coming in fast on three wheels, but it may be hard on the equipment, and it'll require either a very long landing run or excessive use of the brakes. Now let's try it once more, only a little slower this time. Continue in a normal gliding approach and forget that you have a tricycle landing gear. Make a conventional tail low landing. It's practically impossible to get your tail low enough to drag it on the runway. It's for this reason that a tail skid is not installed. In slow motion, your landing should look something like this. You should contact the ground at about 95 miles per hour. Keep the stick well back and hold the nose wheel off the ground as long as possible. The plane will slow down quite rapidly in this attitude without the use of brakes. When you apply your brakes, the nose wheel will come down. There's absolutely no danger of nosing over no matter how hard you apply the brakes. However, the brakes are powerful enough to lock the main wheels and burn out a tire. Use them intermittently. When you taxi back from the runway, open your coolant shutters to keep the engine from overheating. Bring your flaps up. But remember the flaps, not your landing gear. Then bring her in and park her. To shut off the engine, pull the mixture control back to idle cutoff and advance your throttle slightly. When the engine is stopped, turn off your ignition switch, then your battery and generator switches. The flap and landing gear switches should be put in the neutral position. Then turn off your radio receiver and transmitter. Well, that's the story, Lieutenant. She's all yours.
Just remember, fellows, this plane handles much like any other. It's not a hot landing ship, but it is fast, and it may respond a little quicker than you're accustomed to. Just take it easy until you get the feel of the controls. You'll find that you'll get along very well together. As a team, you and this plane have an important job to do in winning this war.